Pleasant morning from everyone. Oh, one moment, please. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Davy. I am the Chief Communications Officer and CXC Coordinator for the NJF. Welcome one and all to another session. For some of you, this is your first session with us. For others, you are returning residents, but welcome one and all. All right, um, gentle reminder that the session is recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, tomorrow, the latest, right? We're working on it. All right, um, in the interim, I'm gonna ask you guys to, um, Go ahead and follow the social media pages, subscribe where necessary, because most of our communication flows through our social media platforms, right? So while we wait, we'll be starting at 1010, right? So allow more persons to enter the room, and then I'll be handing over to our tutor, Keenan Faulkner, at, right, said time, 1010, all right? Oh, so we will do the session is that each hour we will do one module so you know you have three modules module one two and three we're gonna start with module one and go on to 11 o'clock then module two and then module three so i'm gonna ask 
everybody first to mute your mics and I will soon share my screen. And we're gonna take a five minute break in between each module. So if everybody is ready, then we will get ready to go. And if there are any questions, then you can always feel free to type in the chat and I will address them as I go along after I complete each question. So we're gonna go through three different um, papers, well, not full papers, but three questions um, from each module in each hour. It's the end that we written. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And we I'm are- I'm gonna ask if everybody can mute their mics. I'll be the only one speaking. All right, and uh, it should take us the hour to get through the three questions from each module and we take a five minute break at the top of the hour and we get into the, the next module afterwards. So if everybody is ready, as I said, um, for those who might have joined late, you can put your questions in the chat and if we're ready to begin, then I'll start reading the first question. All right, so is everybody able to see the screen? And just indicate in the chat. Occasionally, I'll be looking at the chat. Um, so you'll be seeing it at the same time. So don't worry about that. All right. So let's let's get into it. Now. So this is taken from a 2006 paper, and we know that module one deals with gathering and processing information. So. Um, and, and module two deals with, you know, language and community. So that deals with the whole idea of Creole um, communication um, as versus standard English. And then module three is speaking and writing. But this one is gathering and processing information. You're given uh, prose that you have to read and answer a few questions related to um, communication and different language techniques and um, all of those things. So I'm going to read this twice. Um, so, I, but as you're seeing it on the screen, everybody, I'm sure, is reading it as it as it's going along. So, look at them behind their counters. Young, neatly outfitted in their starched fast food uniforms or their linen and polyester clerk suits, they quickly and effortlessly tap the keys on their cash registers and computers, and cell phones, and look quite efficient, don't they? They seem as if they can think, don't they? Don't let the press close and technology fool you. Many of them can't. Let there be a glitch or a breakdown, and then you'll see what lies beneath the suits and uniforms and beyond the counters. Operates of broken down cash registers and computers who will fumble to spell and calculate. And you, older than they, will wonder what they spent their primary and secondary school years learning. You can spot them every day, everywhere. Last week, for example, I saw the brain of a young attendant at a fast food outlet shut down the instant his computer crashed. Before the crash, he had appeared capable as he punched the appropriate keys for orders. But when he was faced with having to write down what his customers wanted, he could only operate in slow motion. I know because to my misfortune, I was about to order a tuna sandwich and a large orange juice when the system failed. After a minute or two of trying to spell the two items, he scrunched up the piece of paper and started writing afresh on a second sheet. I was not sure I'd get the correct meal. Two days after this calamity, I encountered one of Mr. Illiteracy's pals, Miss Enumeracy, in a store downtown when I was trying to pay a bill of $26.05 with two $20 bills. Because of a mix-up, the cash register was closed, and so the young girl had to calculate on paper how much change to give me. After an eternity of scratching her head, and calculating on a sheet of paper, she handed me $14.05. But thanks to my standard five teacher, I had already calculated in my head that I should have received 
and I told her so she seemed mentally paralyzed. Luckily, another suited girl who looked senior in age and rank came to her rescue. She whipped out a calculator, pressed a few keys, and presto, gave me the right to change, scolding Miss Enumeracy for her bad math. I left thinking sadly that there was nothing I could do to help them make up for the years they had spent in their classrooms, not bothering to learn how to read, write, count, or think. Okay. So I'm going to read it again, and then we're going to go straight into the quiz. So everybody can get a feel of what's happening. So look at them behind their counters. Young, neatly outfitted in their starched fast food uniforms or their linen and polyester clerk suits. They quickly and effortlessly tap keys on their cash registers and computers, answer phones and look quite efficient, don't they? They seem as if they can think, don't they? Don't let the press close and technology fool you. Many of them can't. Let there be a glitch or a breakdown and then you'll see what lies beneath the suits and uniforms and beyond the counters. Operates of broken down cash registers and computers who will fumble to spell and calculate. And you, older than they, will wonder what they spent their primary and secondary school years learning. You can spot them every day, everywhere. Last week, for example, I saw the brain of a young attendant at a fast food outlet shut down the instant his computer crashed. Before the crash, he had appeared capable as he punched the appropriate keys for orders. But when he was faced with having to write down what his customers wanted, he could only operate in slow motion. I know because to my misfortune, I was about to order a tuna sandwich and a large orange juice when the system failed. After a minute or two of trying to spell the two items, he scrunched up the piece of paper and started writing afresh on a second sheet. I was not sure I did the correct meal. Two days after the calamity, I encountered one of Mr. Illiteracy's pals, Miss Enumeracy, in a store downtown and I was trying to pay a bill of $26.05 with two $20 bills. Because of a mix-up, the cash register was closed. And so the young girl had to calculate on paper how much change to give me. After an eternity of scratching her head and calculating on a sheet of paper, she handed me $14.05. But thanks to my standard five teacher, I had already calculated in my head that I should have received $13.95. When I told her so, she seemed mentally paralyzed. Luckily, another suited girl who looked senior in age and rank came to her rescue. She whipped out a calculator, pressed a few keys, and presto gave me the right change, scolding Miss Enumeracy for her bad math. I left thinking sadly that there was nothing I could do to help them make up for the years they had spent in their classrooms, not bothering to learn how to read, write, count, or think. Right? So read it twice, and it's an extract adapted from Between the Lines, um, written in the Train and Tobago Newsday, um, 2004, page 11. Seems like it, it, it is a um, letter to the editor or a newspaper column or something. That's the, the source. So the first question in questions like this in module one is normally state the writer's main purpose in no more than 30 words. Okay? So usually you're asked to either state the purpose or you're asked to give the main point or, or something. So when you're stating the purpose, um, I want a few suggestions. Anybody is willing to type in the chat. What do you think the writer's purpose? In fact, what is going on in this whole extra? What is the whole point of, of writing it? Anybody can feel free to answer. Um, nobody wants to actually speak using the mic. I just don't want persons talking over each other. So that's why I prefer the chat. I mean, what's, what's happening in the, in the extra? Nobody? So let me... Let me say what, what is happening. Persons have been so reliant on technology that they can't function without it. It is the youth who um, do not possess basic math, math skills. All right. Um, person who has raised their hand, you can, you can go ahead. Or you can just type it in the chat. 
So is it to like inform the masses or people about like the literature of people and them not paying attention in school? Uh, that can work. Uh, it's close enough. Uh, let me read a, a couple more answers. Describe showing it, um, excessive reliance on technology. Okay, so persons uh, bring attention to lack of application of knowledge learned in the classroom into the real world. All right, so everybody seems to get the, the gist of it basically. Um, but the important thing here is whatever way you phrase it, try not to go over the 30 words um, because they'll stop reading at 30 and then you'll potentially lose mark. So try and be as concise as possible. That's what they're, they're looking for, even if you're not completely accurate. So the main purpose is using workers in a restaurant and how they work effectively because they're in a fast food restaurant. The writer intends to show how people are becoming increasingly dependent on technology in the workplace, suggesting their incapability without it. So um, as I can see, most of the answers in the chat are saying that, to, that they're over-reliant, excessively reliant on technology, um, highlight dependency on technology, or reliance on people and technology. So everybody is is understanding what that is right and the second one is right and i have no more than 500 words in which you include reference to the following so we're not going to write the actual essay we're just going to go through the, the, the points that you would have but in the essay you're, you're you're beginning to state things like the writer's purpose um right and we went through that in the first one show the um, people are dependent on technology to use that to express the importance of learning other ways to do other things without it example checking without a cash machine as used in the passage um, to bring to attention the irony of people effectiveness in the workplace their fancy suits mean nothing without technology so we saw where the persons they they're well dressed they look like they're well educated they look like um they have things put together and yet that's that's not really the case because everybody you know is relying on uh, they can't do simple maths without technology and and so on um strategies and language techniques use um so before i move on to the answer for that one does anybody have any suggestions on what the things what strategies and language techniques were used does everybody know what are strategy, um, strategies and language techniques? Are any examples of, of them? So let me go back to the, the entire extract, just so persons can, can read um, it. Yeah, problem statement. Um, contrast and compare. And where's the example of it? If you if you identified it, I just hold the answer, and then we'll we'll look at the, the real answer, the actual answers after. But okay, you said contrast and compare. Um, Kayla, I think you have your hand raised. Sir, I was going to say anecdote. Okay. Um, Odin, you have your hand raised. Sir, um, one language technique um, is rhetorical question. Yeah, that, that, a lot of that was in there. Repetition, evidence, rhetorical question. Most persons saying rhetorical question. Satire, yes, that's also in there. Sharp paragraph, statistical data. Um, if cause and effect, compare and contrast. Irony, rhetorical question, examples. Okay, sharp paragraphs um, to focus on different points. All right. Most persons seem seem to be getting it. Um, okay, most persons seem seem to be get, getting the, the entire gist. So as you've seen, the use of short paragraphs and short sentences. So it captures the reader's interest. The writer is informative and persuasive. The use of illustrations and like, feel free to um, you know take screenshots or anything of, of any of this, but the documents will, will be sent to you in any case. And of course, the session is recorded, but it's just for us to go through so that I know that all of you or most of you are on the same page going into the exam. So short paragraphs, short sentences, writers informative and persuasive, illustrations, mainly in the writer's um, reflection on previous encounters. So that's the same thing, basically I'm saying examples, he's using examples to highlight 
um, differences in, in the base contrast and, and compare. Persuasive techniques, rhetorical questions. Most persons said that. Um, use of climax of words in the last lines. So he said, like, to learn how to read, write, count, or think. Sometimes, you know, you think he's being feisty and um, he's using a lot of satire. So plenty of literary devices like hyperbole. So he's calling the person Mr. Illiteracy or Miss Numeracy. Um, after two days of this calamity, um, she whipped out a calculator, mentally paralyzed. Those are examples of the language techniques they're using. It's clearly exaggerating a uh, dramatic effect. Um, the writer's choice of words, very important, adds to the way he exaggerates, evokes interest. For example, she whips out her calculator after an eternity of scratching her head and so on. Punctuation is also important to bring out clarity in the extract. Um, yeah, just asking everybody to mute their mic, um, just a reminder. They can hear some of the background noise from some person. Right, um, punctuation, commas, exclamation marks, semicolon, don't forget those. So remember, there's no limit on the number of um, techniques that are, are used. Just make sure that you are able to differentiate between language techniques, which are more literary devices, as opposed to things like um, organizational structure. So the strategies are, th this question combines the two of them. So it didn't matter the order. But if they ask you separately, you would have to figure out which ones are actually organizational strategies, such as the short paragraphs and the punctuation and so on, as opposed to things that are more literary. So, just reminding everybody, mute your mics, please. Um, so the difference, language techniques are literary devices and so on. Organizational strategies are more related to the structure the, um, that, that is used in terms of punctuation, paragraphs, and, and so on. Um, so evidence of expressive writing relies on personal experiences and so on. So that should answer that question um, comprehensively. So the third question in, in that essay type um, question, appropriateness of a tone and register used. So does everybody understand the difference between tone and register? Um, Oh, they're very similar, but slightly different. You can type in the chat, whatever um, comes to your mind. Tone and register used in the whole extra. Like how did he sound? What did his tone sound like? And the register is more like, what kind of, of language is he, is he using and is he conveying? Sure, um, excuse me, when it comes to register, um, wouldn't it be like the way between two people and come to having a dialogue. That's what you're talking about, sir. It's not like, a dialogue. Register, register and all of that. I mean, well, register only doesn't really only apply to dialogue. It, it applies to any um, form of communication that is being conveyed, whether written or or spoken. It's just how oh, the register is really is it formal, informal, basically. Um, the tone is how does it sound? So the tone is very conversational. In this case, he's basically saying, he's having a conversation with you. He's writing a letter, right? Remember, it's a letter column in the newspaper. And he's basically making fun of the students and stuff. And he's like, pretend that he's speaking to you um, directly. And, and he's trying to have a conversation with you. He's asking you rhetorical questions. He's saying, like, isn't this so or isn't this how, how this goes? Or like, you know, when um, Jamaicans are, are trying to have a conversation with you, and they pull you in and they say like, um, not true or a lie metal, basically. So he's trying to have a conversation with you. But in this case, he's formal. And that's why the, the source at the end of the extract is so important, right? Um, where I said that it came in a newspaper, right? what I'm highlighting now, between the lines, Trey and Tobago Newsday, he's writing in the newspapers. He has to converse formally. So his tone is conversational, his register is formal, right? Because the medium that he's writing in is, is, is a formal. Although persons do it, that they can write patwa or whatever in um, text or in the newspaper, and some persons will do it like Carolyn Cooper, 
Um, for the most part, you can tell that this is formal because of the, the language that is used and where it is published, if you ever ask the question. So those are things you're right to get to get uh, marks. And remember the whole question in and of itself is worth 25 marks. So just think of it as, as close to 20 um, points as possible and you should be okay um, for the whole question. So formal register and it's appropriate. Um, sometimes they'll, yeah, they'll ask you to comment on the appropriateness. Is it appropriate for this situation? Is it something, should they have spoken differently? Why? So you don't have to say, yes um but you say why yes um why shouldn't it have been something else you know maximize the marks that way so it suggests that as the readers go deep down into what the writer is saying they crave more of what he's saying and being conversational also creates a better appreciation of the way in which the writer expresses his points so when people are in conversations they exaggerate to bring out their points and we know that from persons are speaking in jamaican parlance like they will really exaggerate the story because they want people to listen to them and it sounds interesting. So as evidence, the writer exaggerates to prove his points and this is seen in his choice of words and that's it. You, you get the full marks that you would get for a question like this. If you just state it clearly and concisely. That's what examiners do when they're marking things like come studies and English. It's not about the fancy words or the sophistication of the explanation it really has to do with clarity and um being concise so persons can write a lot of things thinking that they'll get a lot of marks and it's a lot of gibberish or repetitive stuff you can state the sentence um three points in the sentence two points in the sentence and the examiner is able to read it as clearly as this then you'll be okay um so i um reading through the chat tone um humorous yeah it, you can say humorous as well and conversational tone is how does the writer feel about the extra um you can yeah you can use that as a definition as well um you know to review the private message right? the resources will be sent yes as i said it's recorded this will be sent to you as well so you don't have to worry if you have a session that clashes with something Annoyance and pity, yeah, that that comes out as well. Um, annoyance, he's clearly annoyed um, at the the persons that are um, having to the young people who can't seem to do anything without technology. Pity, in some ways, um, he pities them as well. Like I said, if you can justify your answer, there's no one right answer. As long as you can justify it, it may it helps to also put back um, the examples that you see in the extra, refer to a particular line, write out a particular sentence of, of evidence, show them that you actually understand the thing and you're putting in the effort to demonstrate that. that, that. Um, which section of the paper is this? This is the first section. So we're going through module by module, and this is the first module, gathering and processing information. So now that we're finished with the first question, we can move on to the second one. Uh, this is from a paper from 2007, and I'm going to read the extract again um, twice, and then we go through a, a similar set of questions. That's what we're doing in the marathon, just to um, ensure that you guys have the, everything embedded and enmeshed so that you don't, um, you're able to recall things better. All right, so uh, reading the extract the first time, I heard about superstition and like I said, use the chat, um, stop me if you have to. Although I, I, you know, we don't really have that much time. We're just going through motions. So we put it in the chat and I will respond to it as soon as I can. So the first time I heard about superstition was when I mentioned to my mother that this year was a leap year. Oh, plenty of people are got dead this year, she said. A rather pessimistic assumption startled me. Why would anyone think that because it was a leap year, more people were going to die? Thinking my mother had listened to too many tall tales, I casually mentioned the myth to a friend. Yes, I saw me here all the time. Leap years are bad luck, she said. Well, I had never heard such a thing. How many people believe this? Intrigued, I proceeded to conduct an informal survey. I was surprised at how many people of all ages held the same view. 
One person even said that it was already evident pointing to the spate of killings in Spanish town since the beginning of the year. But was there any other evidence that suggested that this was a true phenomenon? My first stop after the internet was a sociologist hoping he could answer my question. Where do people come up with this stuff? Professor Barry Chevans is the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. He told me that folklore is sometimes based on facts, so I launched a fact-finding mission. The Statistical Institute of Jamaica has on its website the death rates in Jamaica for the years 1991 to 2002. That time frame gave me three years to study, 1992 and 1996 and 2000. And here are the facts according to how statinja.com. In 1991, death rate was 5.6 per thousand means population. In 1992, it was 5.5. 1993, 5.7, 1995, 6.7, 1997, 6.0, 1999, 6.8, 2000, 6.3, while in 2001, it was 6.2. So with the exception of 1996, there was no noticeable rise in deaths in Jamaica during a leap year. Actually, the rates seem to drop during the leap year. I'm sure that many people's hearts are lighter now. So here's some more good news. It's also said that the only time for a woman to propose marriage without bad luck is um, in a leap year. But don't plan your wedding in a leap year, though, or there's sure to be some bad luck, or so the legend says. Okay. So they didn't give us um, a source for this one, um, but I'm going to read it again. But clearly, when you begin to form first impressions in your mind, you're going to see that a lot of statistical data is in this, obviously. Um, so the first time I heard about superstition was when I mentioned to my mother that this year was a leap year. Oh, plenty of people are dead this year, she said. A rather pessimistic assumption startled me. Why would anyone think that because it was a leap year, more people were going to die? Thinking my mother had listened to too many tall tales, I casually mentioned the myth to a friend. Yes, I saw me here all the time. Leap years are bad luck, she said. Well, I had never heard such a thing. How many people believe this? I in intrigued, I proceeded to conduct an informal survey. I was surprised at how many people of all ages held the same view. One person even said that it was already evident pointing to the spate of killings in Spanish town since the beginning of the year. But was there any other evidence that suggested that this was a true phenomenon? My first stop after the internet was a sociologist hoping he could answer my question. Where do people come up with this stuff? Professor Bay Shabans is a dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. He told me that folklore is sometimes based on fact, so I launched a fact-finding mission. The Statistical Institute of Jamaica has on its website the death rates in Jamaica for the years 1991 to 2002. That time frame gave me three years to study, 1992, 1996, and 2000. And here are the facts according to Statin. 1991, the death rate was 5.6. 1992 was 5.5. 1993, 5.7. 1995, 6.7. 1997, 6.0, 1999, 6.8, 2000, 6.3, while in 2001, it was 6.2. So with the exception of 1996, there was no noticeable rise in deaths in Jamaica during a leap year. Actually, the rates seemed to drop during a leap year. I'm sure that many people's hearts are light or no. So here's some more good news. It's also um, said that the only time for a woman to propose marriage without bad luck is in a leap year. But don't plan your wedding in a leap year, though, or there's sure to be some bad luck, or so the legend goes. Right? So, based on the extract, we see that this person, uh, they could just be a curious observer, um, just a, a student. But the point is, they are trying to find a statistical relationship between the number of deaths um, in a leap year compared to pre. Um, years around the leap year and so they went on a mission where they found some statistics they interviewed um, persons they did their research and they came up with a, with a conclusion right uh, but I guess I probably gave away the, the answer to the first question so state the writer's main point no more than 30 years so if you realize this is a variation of the question in the previous um, the previous type of question so we, we spoke about the purpose, right? So the, when you are describing some the purpose of writing that is described in terms of adjectives. So the purpose is they are describing, they are explaining, they're examining, they're 
in farming, whatever it is. But the main point now is literally just a, a point. What is the, it is more um, known than, than adjective. So what is the main point? What is the, the writer here trying to convey? And I'm looking out for answers in the chat. Or if anybody wants to speak or not really speak over each other, you can raise your hand. So the writer's main point. Investigate truthfulness of a statement made by her mother. Um, hmm. It can be part of the answer, but I don't think it's, it's comprehensive. So the main point, what is the writer trying to do? What, are, what is it that they are trying to say? Superstitions are not valid. Prove validity of the idea that there's an increase in deaths during a leap year. Um, all right, unless there are any more answers. So the writer points out the degree of belief that people link to superstitions of death on a leap year and attempts to prove the reliability of such folklore. So it's important that we mention the real point in the extract is how much people believe in superstitions. So it's like a, a conjoined point. Basically, the writer is saying people are superstitious. Um, they, they, you know, belief kills, belief cures. And also um, they use this superstition regarding death. Um, you know, in a leap year and attempts to prove the reliability. So persons had said it, they're trying to prove the validity of a statement regarding um, leap years and death. Find out um, mysterious superstition of increasing deaths during a leap year. Find out the fact about the assumption of a leap year. Okay, fine. Um, right, so that is essentially the, the main point in, in this. Every superstition surrounding bad, bad luck in a leap year Little evidence supporting death in increase in leap year compared to others. Okay, yeah, I, I like that answer. But as it as I said with the first one, just ensure that it's concise and brief because you don't want to ramble too much and pass 30 words. I'm not going to read past it, I'm going to lose marks. So just ensure that it is within the um, stipulated uh, word limit. So points out the degree of belief that people link to superstitions of death on a leap year and attempts to prove the reliability of those folklores. Or using what people say about leap years and the number of deaths, the writer points out deep belief in superstition and attempts to prove the reliability of those folklores. Right. So the second question in this module is usually like the first one. The, um, write an essay of no more than 500 words, which you identify the writer's purpose, comment on the strategies and language techniques used. That's always the this kind of question. And we're just going to go through the, the, the main points. Uh, again, we're not going to sit and write the essay. So the writer's purpose. Um, well, you guys would have would have said it, um, and it would have come out in the, the main point as well. So we don't have to really ask this. Um, to point out how much we believe in superstitions, to prove the reliability of such superstitions using data and facts. That's literally it. Um, and it should be clear to, to most persons. Main point, right, and tries to discover if a leap year has a higher death rate compared to other years. Yeah, that's acceptable. All of those answers that persons have been saying in the chat are acceptable. Um, so comment on language strategies, strategies and language techniques. And remember the, the difference between the two strategies are mostly the organizational items. So punctuation, spacing, formatting, all of that. Language techniques are more on the side of literary devices. So before I reveal the answer, persons can put in the chat or they can raise their hand. What do you think are the strategies and language techniques that were used in this extract? And go back to the extract so persons can read it as they are formulating the answers. But we did say it before, um, statistics is, is one of them. That's the most obvious one. Um, are there any others? that jump out at you. Statistical data, contrast, yeah. Source of authority, 
yeah, that's an important one, expert sources, because you did go to the, the dean of the faculty, who's a sociologist, so he's trying to speak from authority. So this data, reputable institution, historical data, rhetorical question. Okay, yeah, most persons uh, saying statistical data, rhetorical question, rhetorical question. Compare and contrast, irony, okay, yeah. Um, Hypophora. Authoritative sources. All right, so most persons seem seem to be getting. I'm not ignoring the rest, just um, trying to be conscious of them. Um, but I'm going to read them as I go along. I just want to get through to the answer. So, strategies and techniques. So, use of short paragraphs and sentences. That was evident here, just like the last one. This evades tediousness, brings clarity to the work. The writer makes his work seem very interesting to read and at and just looking at. And remember when you are answering this question, it's an essay. So while we here are just listing the answers in the actual exam, we don't intend for you to just list. We want to actually explain why this is applicable and why this um, you know, is part of the answer, justify the answer. Like just like how these are listed out, A to, to H. If you don't have time to write the essay, if you write the points just like this, you're gonna get the marks same way. Um, but just don't leave it off the paper. So um, you have short sentences and paragraphs. You just write that as a point, explain it. Next one, writer is persuasive, uses rhetorical questions which appeals to the reader's interest and makes them willing to continue reading. So you have to say why. Why does the author use these things? Why would he use a rhetorical question? Why would he use short paragraphs? So the writer uses first person narrative which complements the conversational tone. Um, I remember sometimes they combine questions. So I remember in the last question we had um, a sub question about tone and register. They might not ask it separately here, but you can comment on it. Comment on the tone, comment on the feel of the whole um, extract. Sarcasm and irony. Yes, some person mentioned irony at the end. Writer is trying to prove that superstitions are not reliable. He still believes in them. And this is evident in his concluding paragraph. But don't plan your wedding in a leap year or there's sure, sure to be some value. He's mocking um, the people who think like that, basically. And we see that we use the example of the, the line we refer to it. You can refer to the line either by writing it out or you can use um, the, you can just use a line number if it is there. But as long as that will give you additional marks. This is the bulk of the essay. This is like um, mostly at least 20 of the 25 marks you have for the whole quiz. Statistical data, yeah, everybody said that, so it's obvious. Language is simple and effective, so describe the language as well. Is it complicated? Is it um, easy to understand what is it? Literary device, um, assonance, tall tales, you know, that sounds like um, constant um, consonants um, next to each other, tall tales. Um, use of punctuation, which brings clarity to the writer's work. Um, yeah, and that's it for that question. They just decided to put everything into one. So this would have been worth 20 marks about the 500 word essay. And the first one would have been worth five marks about the, the point of the extra. Sir, mm -hmm. so um, what is the limit um, amount of language technique and strategies you can um, talk about? There's no limit. So you can, as it comes to you and you can give an example and it's there, just write it down. Mm -hmm. There is no limit. The okay. only limit that you have is with respect to the actual um, 30 word question where you're describing the purpose or the main point. That's it. But in terms of the essay, but be mindful of time, but there's no, there's no limit on the information. So even though we have a set answer right here and it gives us about seven or eight of these um, questions, of, of, of these points for answers, you um, are not, it's not exhaustive. There could, there could be more that the examiners don't see. So like persons were saying hypophora, um, and that is also, also in it, but it's not here. So you can include that as part of the answer. So Sir, are you, then, are you then saying that when the exam paper is saying you are to comment or talk about three language techniques and three organizational strategies. We are not just to do three of each. And there are times when the paper comes to say, and or 
we are not able to mix and match language techniques and uh, strategies? Of, um, my best advice is just to follow the instruction as it is. So like in this case, no, they didn't put a limit on it, but if they did just specify three, then ensure that you don't give less than three. Um, no. Because you're not going to, yeah, yeah you're going to lose marks. So if you want to give more, you can give more. Um, if you feel that the three aren't confident, they'll probably, they, they're, the examiners aren't hard people. So they, some will re read the first three, but a smart examiner will, will say, okay, if he doesn't have the answer in the first three of them, I'm going to continue reading. And if he ha has it, I'm going to give him the mark anyway. But just ensure that you don't give less, less than what they say. It's always, the, as a rule of thumb, give more but don't give less. thank you hyper four so hyper four is a, a situation where you would ask a question and then you, you basically answer it yourself um you immediately answer it so that is um a lot of a lot of examples well not a lot of but there was an example in in the the extra um so yeah, was there any other evidence that suggested there was a true phenomenon? How many people believe this? Um, where do people come up with this stuff? So he's asking uh, the, these questions and he practically answers them himself. Like, you know, it's almost similar to rhetoric, but not quite. Um, yeah. Those examples are not dead. If you're detailed enough, you'll pick them up. Um, but like I said, it's once you have other answers, you don't really have to go so far into the, the nitty gritty. Like I said, they, they want concise, clear answers. The sophistication doesn't is not that important. Um, all right, so we're gonna go to the third one. And after this one, we take a five minute break and we'll move on to the module, um, module with language and, and community. Um, Um, so this one is another extract from 2008. So it's an alarming prospect. The recent report out of the UK equating the spread of surveillance technology to the rise of the big brother state is enough to send more than the occasional shiver down one's spine. It would seem that George Orwell's Society of the Further has been transported from the pages of his satirical novel 1984 directly into the real world. Totalitarian society of Orwell's novel, written way back in 1949, has no place for truth since historical records are destroyed and information is replaced by propaganda. Additionally, thought and love attract punishment and privacy simply doesn't exist. But it is the ominous warning, Big Brother is watching you, conveyed through placards in the imaginary Orwellian state that is probably best remembered by readers of 1984. That warning is certainly apropos if the British report on the emergence of the big brother state is anything to go by. Drawn up by a team of respected academics, the document is said to paint a disturbing picture of what Britain and elsewhere, I suggest, could be like in 10 years time, unless the use of spy technologies is regulated. Anyone reading the newspaper or watching the international TV news within the last week or so would have gathered that the UK is one of the three world leaders in the use of surveillance technology and the Brits, the most spied on citizens in what most of us still think of as the free world. Followed of New York's 9-11 terrorist attack and more recent London bombings, this obsession with surveillance is becoming contagious. And my guess is that it won't be long before Big Brother makes his presence more obvious here in our own backyard. The British report on the spread of surveillance technology looks at the time in the not too distant future when human beings everywhere may be forced to be microchipped with implants under the skin, storing personal information, allowing everyone's movements to be tracked. Claim made by editors, Dr. David Murakami Wood, um, managing editor of the journal, and Dr. Christy Bell, Open University Lecturer in Organization Studies, is astonishing. It asserts that by 2016, almost every movement, purchase, and communication of these chip citizens could be monitored by a complex network of interlinking surveillance technologies. Some time ago, it was disclosed that the use of radio frequency identification in humans with the implementation of chips in 70 mentally ill patients was being put on trial in the United States. 
the claims of the official British report proved to be accurate, such use would, in a decade or so, be unlimited and the Orwellian state would have become a reality. Only this past week, the BBC revealed the presence of 4.3 million surveillance cameras in Britain, and viewers were informed that the average Britain is caught on camera some 300 times every day. Okay. I know this one might seem a bit more complex than the first two. Um, it is from Jeanette Lane Clark, Shades of 1984 in the Sunday Sun. That's a British newspaper um, in November 2006. Okay. So the person is writing a newspaper opinion editorial a column. I know it's a bit complex, so I will try to read it again. Um, so yeah, we see it has real world implications. Somebody commented 2022, the person was commenting that up to 2016, um, these things might happen. And you know, we're all um, familiar with technology and, and privacy and data and all of those things that people talk about in the news. And we see it probably coming to fruition today in, in real life. Uh, these are the things said, but then, so we've been talking about these things for a long time now. George Orwell in his novel, his novel is called 1980. That's, that's the title of the novel. Orwellian um, relates to the things that he is writing. Big Brother spying on you, your computer chip or your television or your smartphone or your laptop, whatever it is. Those are the things that they were worried about back then. Um, remember? So 1984, it wasn't written in 1984, it was long before then, to show, to show you how this has been a problem for, for decades, and we now see it actually coming into real life. I suppose probably I gave away the answer about the, the whole main point and the purpose, but it's good to have a discussion so that everybody is understanding what is happening. So it's an alarming prospect, the recent report out of the UK equating the spread of surveillance technology to the rise of the Big Brother state, is enough to send more than the occasional shiver down one's spine. It would seem that George Orwell's society of the, that should be society of the future, not further. Society of the future has been transported from the pages of his satirical novel, 1984, directly into the real world. The totalitarian society of Orwell's novel, written way back in 1949, has no place for truth since historical records are destroyed and information is replaced by propaganda. Additionally, thought and love attract punishment and privacy simply doesn't exist. But is the ominous warning Big Brother is watching you conveyed through placards in the imaginary Orwellian state that is probably best remembered by readers of 1984? That warning is certainly apropos. So that is a, um, it's a word. Apropos means like it's appropriate. If the British report on the emergence of the Big Brother state is anything to go by. Drawn up by a team of respected academics, the document is said to paint a disturbing picture of what Britain, and elsewhere I suggest, could be like in 10 years time unless the use of spy technologies is regulated. Um, anyone reading the newspaper or watching the international TV news within the last week or so would have gathered that the UK is one of the three world leaders in the use of surveillance technology. And the Brits, the most spied on citizens in what most of us st still think of as the free world. A fallout of New York's 9-11 terrorist attack and more recent London bombings, this occasion, obsession with surveillance is becoming contagious. And my guess is that it won't be long before Big Brother makes his presence more obvious here in our own backyard. The British report on the spread of surveillance technology looks at time in the not too distant future when human beings everywhere may be forced to be microchipped with implants under the skin storing personal information, allowing everybody's movements to be tracked. The claim made by editors, Dr. David Wood, managing editor of the journal, and Dr. Christy Bell um, Ball, Open University lecturer, is astonishing. It asserts that by 2016, um, movement, purchase, and communication of these chip citizens could be monitored by a complex network of interlinking surveillance technologies. Some time ago, it was discovered that the use of radio frequency identification in humans with the implantation of chips in 70 mentally ill patients was being put on trial in the United States. If the claims of the official British report proved to be accurate, such use would in a decade or so be unlimited and the Orwellian state would have become a reality. Only this past week, the BBC revealed the presence of 4.2 million surveillance cameras in Britain, and viewers were informed that average Britain is caught on camera some 300 times every day. Right? And as I said, it's from a newspaper column um, in a British, British newspaper in, in 2006. 
So they have decided to combine all the questions that we usually go through into one question this time. Write an essay of no more than 500 words in which you include reference to the following. The writer's purpose, that's the first one. So the writer's purpose, um, there's no word limit that they have said on the writer's purpose in this one. So persons can put in the chat or they can um, you know, raise their hand and, and mention what is the writer's purpose. So we'll go reach the strategies and the techniques yet, but we want to know what is the writer's purpose. Ready? Nobody? Writer's purpose? And the person is writing about spying and surveillance and you know everybody should be worried that this thing is going to be um, a part of our lives right um you know and this was in 2006 um most persons in in this room were probably babies and, and, and very young toddlers um writer's purpose from the public and the lack of privacy with increasing um, technology from persons that they are being tracked. I know, like, I know this one is, is a bit harder than, than the other two. I'm interested to see some answers. Writer's purpose. So answers aren't really flowing for this one. So somebody wants to speak. Or they just have the mic on. Reveal how technology is improving and tracking persons. Highlight that as technology evolves, our privacy is at risk. Okay, yeah, I, like, I like that one. Um, but you're all, you're all correct. I mean, you all have elements of the answer. So to inform us about the rise of surveillance technology in Britain, as well as the importance of this growing technology, like I said, there are multiple answers. They are, you can be written in different ways. Give readers an idea of future surveillance technology and their and their implications on survival and privacy to reveal the irony of living in a free society in fact we are not free with such technologies because i did mention that we live in a free society free world but does is it really free when you have these um large entities countries corporations big brother that's what they call them big brother just hovering over you and spying on you through whatever these technology devices are and we read some more answers Informed audience about the dark agendas which are imminent to surveillance technology in Britain. Okay, yeah. create awareness on the new surveillance technologies and how it will affect future. Sensitize British readers on their lack of privacy due to a rise in surveillance camera um, installations. Purpose to inform the public that technology is more advanced to the extent that they are being tracked. Bring awareness to the segregation due to the invasion of privacy in technology. Okay, so everybody basically gets, gets the gist. The purpose is really, yes, inform about the increased use of surveillance technology and what does it mean for, for us, the implications of this technology um, for the average citizen, right? And, you know, the next one, the next question, as we have come to expect by now, is related to strategies and language techniques used. Uh, I probably shouldn't have given away the answer before persons would have, would have seen it. So we have, we have done enough of this to know the difference, um, but we have combined them. So the, the difference doesn't really matter in this one. Just list them. Like there are at least 10 of them that you can probably find. Question, this part of the question is worth maybe 20 of the 25 marks. So if you can find 10 like just, and just identify it and explain, that is your 20 marks right here. Or if you can find maybe seven, eight of them, you should be okay. Um, but try not to let it be like less than five. Because the answer won't be obvious. Sometimes you have to read it again to find out what are the strategies and techniques. So just let me hear them. What are the source of authority? Yes, I'm glad somebody mentioned that. Why? Because if it wasn't apparent, um, so in this line, the person, they've mentioned the person's credentials. They're the managing editor of this and this journal, right? They're a lecturer in this um, field, in uh, that in this university, right? That is showing you, right? That their positions of authority and why these persons are credible. 
So it's not just the person didn't just write this, that there just to say, or um, just to show off, or just to, um, because it's an unimportant piece of information. It actually means something that they, they told you that this, per, this person is like, um, right? So strategies and techniques used, there are, what, eight of them right here. Uh, let me read some more answers. Alliteration, um, okay, big, big brother. I mean, sharp paragraph, punctuation, use of evidence, statistics, yes, source of authority, yes, um, statistics. Source of authority could as well be expert opinion. Yeah, yeah, that's that's permissible. It's the same thing, right? Um, so you can you can say that um, expert opinion, source of authority, doesn't matter. Giving examples, yes, foreshadowing, um, okay. It's the first time I'm hearing that one being used. You know, I know what it is, but yeah, it's acceptable. So the person is trying to foreshadow a particular event, um, or they basically said it's already here. Like persons are spying on each other now, and th this was articles written in 2006 compared to something written almost 60 years before, and now it's happening in real time. So yeah, that's that's fine. So short paragraphs and sentences. Like I said, remember this paper is 2008, which is years ago. So um, examiners might interpret a similar question differently now. So if you don't see an answer here that you have said, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. So short paragraphs, punctuations, authoritative sources. And just remember that we are seeing a lot of items being repeated here. It simply means that um, they are common to all of these extracts. So even if you can't identify a unique answer for the extract that is given, if you can just identify the general ones that are always present, the short paragraphs, the punctuations, the whole it is formatted and um, the authoritative sources, the things that you expect to see, just write them down because they, they, they will always come in no matter what extract is given, those ones will always come. Use of metonymy in the extract, um, Big Brother State, refers to an, an enemy, right? So a metonymy is something slightly different from, from um, a metaphor. Uh, very informative writing, it's expository, use of irony. Yeah, the irony of being in a free society, but not really free. The tone is ironic and it's conversational and the use of a formal register. So we say that a person wrote in a British newspaper. Um, so we assume that there is a, a degree of formality that is used there. Um, allusion, yeah, because they're alluding to a lot of events that may potentially happen. So all of you are on the right track. This is, like I said, this is just really a refresher for you guys. So I know that you are prepared for the exam. Somebody asking a question? Or the mic is just on. Um, so the effectiveness of the strategies and language techniques identified in B above in achieving the writer's purpose. So Although we have separated them here, like I said, when you're listing them out, you would say, why are they in there? Why are they used, right? And the strategies and the language techniques, um, why are they effective, right? What do they do? What is their purpose? What, what do they really achieve? Um, use of short sentences and paragraphs avoids confusion, makes it easier for the reader to understand, yeah? That's that's our reason. Um, and is it effective? So remember to comment on the effectiveness. They usually ask one of the two of them: is it effective or is it um, is it <clears throat> appropriate? Right? Why is it appropriate? Why is it um, effective? So yeah, short paragraphs and sentences, less tedious in reading, appeals to the interest of the readers from a glance. And I see this question is very extensive. Um, okay, number two. Use of punctuation such as commas, expressive dashes, exclamation marks, adds to the expressive writing techniques, use and strikes interest in the readers. Use of irony is appropriate since it creates tone of the extract. Like, yeah, they're, they're, they're being ironic. They're making fun of the fact that people seem to believe that we live in this free society when that is not the case, right? We are, we are being spied on constantly in different forms everywhere. And people seem to be pretending that this is not happening. So they're very ironic, right? They're, they're literally saying, they're, they're, they're literally making fun of those people. Uh, once the reader enjoys view, 
Um, it's rather ironic to live in a free society. Metonymy, big brother state, creates interest and curiosity in the readers. Yeah, because we've not heard that term a lot, at least not when this was written in 2006, right? Um, we big brother state, what does that mean, right? Um, pay close attention to his words and his expression. Use of a formal register complements the conversational tone that the writer uses and authoritative data adds to the reliability of the writer's opinions and claims. So all of those were intended to achieve a particular purpose. They have, um, and they're effective because of um, the fact that they have achieved all of, all of this, right? So there is a WhatsApp group. Um, so these questions, how will the resources be sent to us? Um, they, I guess it will be sent via email. But I am only responsible for sending it to the organizers and the organizers will handle those um, housekeeping matters. Right? So um, contact the persons who are in NJF, the persons who organize um, this session and they'll be able to give you some more information. You don't have to worry. You'll get all of these um, before, long before the exam. I know you guys' exam is on the 30th. So you have like a, a week and a little bit. So effectiveness of the strategies, you, you explain why. This is like explaining six of them, and that's your 20 marks, 25 marks, right? Right. So it's 12 past the hour, um, according to my watch at least. So we're finished with module one, and we're going to take a little break. I, I'm going to give it 10 minutes. Yeah, let's take a 10 minute break and we come back at 20 minutes. Right? And then we'll go, we'll go straight into module two after that. All right? So don't go too far. You don't want persons to leave um, the, 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 the Zoom call. Right? So don't go too far. We'll just take a break now and, get, and we'll get back to it in 10 minutes. So 10 minutes time. 11.20, that's, 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 it's showing 11.10 for me now. So we will resume at 11.20. Right, everybody, everybody is okay with that. Yeah, I hope everybody heard that so that they come back on time. You have any friends, tell, tell them 11.20. Yes, for the time being, um, NJF can play the interlude. So that's, persons can hear that we are on the right, So 11.20, so we'll take a 10 minute break. I don't know if I want to record it to be paused or to be stopped.
Okay, good. Let me start again. So that's why this country will never get ahead. Never get ahead, she said. Walking around her beauty parlor like a bee just singer. She fold up towels, hang up robes, straighten things that don't need straightening. Wish Pinky would cool down though. People here have no discipline, she's saying. The whole time I was in England, there wasn't one power cut. And that's big prosperous country. Now look at this little island that can't hold its head above water and every minute somebody's on strike. I start to tell her that I hear about a whole heap of strikes in England, but I change my mind. I don't feel like arguing. I just want her to wash my hair and braid it. You don't need electricity for that. But she keep on walking up and down. She's getting on my nerves now. Why she have to criticize the island so much when is she, when is the only place we have for ourselves? I say, look, Pinky, you can wash my hair. At least some sunshine come in so you can see what you're doing. Tell you the truth, Miss Daisy, I don't feel like doing any work today. Last time I see Pinky, she's shining like a morning star. Guess what, Miss Daisy, guess what? I can't believe she is she talking. The English accent gone clean. What, I say, what? I get visa to go to America. I go to the embassy from five o'clock this morning, stand up three hours in line before it open. And when I tell, I'm going to visit a cousin who's getting married. He never asks me a thing, just stamp multiple indefinite in my passport. It's gone, me gone, you know. First plane I can get on. It's too hot here, Miss Daisy, too hot. Can't stand the sun. Now, how you want to hear done today? Right? So it's taken from Alicia McKenzie's Pinky. It's a story in her book, Satellite City and Other Stories, published in 1992 in England. And it's as you can see, it is dialect, but for the most part, um, it does sound Eastern Caribbean, um, Trinidadian. Not really like Jamaica, but you get the idea that it is um, English Creole in some form of Atom. So let's let's read it again. And, but just to form it in your mind, the impression that is going on there in a beauty parlor, um, you know, she's doing her hair. So the first part is one day and the next part is another day, right? And uh, they're discussing things about England and the contrast between England and, and uh, the island that they, that they live on, um, Caribbean island, Caribbean life, and how it is that oh, there are no power cuts over there, what power cuts over here and strikes and, and what have you. So first world, third world um, country problem. So, as that's why this country will never get ahead. Never get ahead, she say. Walking around her beauty parlor like a bee just stinger. She fold up towels, hang up robes, straighten things that don't need straightening. I wish Pinky would cool down though. People here have no discipline, she saying. The whole time I was in England, there wasn't one power cut. And that's big prosperous country. Now look at this little island that can't hold its head above water and every minute somebody's on strike. I start to tell her that I hear about a whole heap of strikes in England, but I changed my mind. I don't feel like arguing. I just want her to wash my hair and braid it. You don't need electricity for that. But she keep on walking up and down. She getting on my nerves now. Why she have to criticize the island so much when it's the only place we have for ourselves? I say, look, Pinky, you can wash my hair. At least some sunshine coming in so you can see what you're doing. To tell you the truth, Miss Daisy, I don't feel like doing any work today. Last time I see Pinky, she's shining like a morning star. Guess what, Miss Daisy, guess what? I can't believe it's she talking. The English accent gone clean. What, I say, what? I get visa to go to America. I go to the embassy from five o'clock this morning, stand up three hours in line before it home. And when I tell her going to visit her cousin who's getting married, he never asks me a thing. Just stamp multiple indefinite in the passport. It's gone, me gone, you know. First plane I can get on. Too hot here, Miss Daisy, too hot. Can't stand sun. Now how you want to hear done today? So, <clears throat> taken from short story, um, Pinky in Satellite City and other story. All right, so the first question in these types of um, questions are module two, an essay, same essay, 500 words, just like the first one. Discuss the use of language in the excerpt, concentrating on the following. So the first one, the relation between the writer's use of language and the context of the narrative. Right? Um, so <clears throat> I just reveal the answer at the same time um, before I move on to the next one. So, but what do we mean by use of language? So we see that in the, the extract, they are switching between Patois and standard English. 
And all of the questions in this module are just like that. It's always Patwa Standard English, Patwa Standard English. But they're essentially asking, why is it that they are using Patwa when they're using it? And why are they using Standard English when they're using it? What is the purpose for using the language in the way that it is used, right? In the context of this night. Even while you're reading the answer, I just want to hear some general feedback in the chat or you can raise your hand. The question that I asked a while, not just in relation to the answer, right? Anybody? No? So let me read the answer then so that everybody gets a clear picture of what's going on. So the writer's language carries both a communicative and reflective purpose. Context behind language suggests a situation of the way in which people view such languages and their implications on communication. So the context suggests a mixture of pride, as in Miss Daisy, and resentment, as in Pinky. The writer's use of language acts as a contrast to the opinions of each character. From Pinky, she uses her language as a reflection of what she sees as a civilized country. She views Creole as shameful, and this is seen in her behavior. But for Miss Daisy, the language is important as this is enforced by her thing of it as the only thing they have. So everybody understands this question, right? Because I'm not seeing any responses from anybody. Typically in this type of question, we the first thing that most persons can see because the, the, um, the way the extract is written, is that they want to convey the idea that using patwa or using Creole is supposed to be shameful. It is supposed to be, um, you know, like when persons have this stigma against um, Creole and patwa, the first thing they say is, oh, you, you chat bad or you talk broken English. Um, and so it's the same thing here, really. Persons, she's viewing Creole as shameful and it is, not to be um, something that you take pride in, but at the same time, Miss Daisy, who is the one to hear the, um, the, the client at the end of she is saying, no, but it's the only thing we have, right? We, it's ours, it's indigenous to us, um, right? We're not taking anything from the white man country or um, from foreign, it's ours, right? So we must embrace it. So I think of it as, as Jamaica, right? Um, Patwa, People um, say about Patwa, but no, you can't talk Patwa, and we, we feel shame about it. But for some persons, there's pride. There's it's called attitudes to language, and they typically ask, what are the things that influence people's attitudes towards language, right? Um, so you, as opposed to English, when they say, oh, you speak is spoken, and, and you only use English in formal settings, and um, there is some amount of pride in 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 using English because it is it is supposed to be better, and so that's what this um, is thing is 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 trying to say the relation between the writer's use of language and the context of the narrative that it is used in. On the one hand, uh, Miss Daisy is saying we should be proud of ourselves and proud of the language we use. On the other hand, Miss Pinky is saying I can't. I'm tired of the country and everything about it and and how um, it's so backward and third world and whatever, and I just want to migrate and go to England, right? Yeah, attitude to language, social factor. Uh, Miss Pinky uses sign English to associate herself, America rather than a woman. Yeah, so everybody gets the, the gist of it. Um, so all of those things, that the factors that impact upon language and the attitudes toward language and so on, that is what they are, basically asking in a question like this, right? Um, mixture of pride in Miss Daisy, resentment in, in Miss Pinky, and the contrast is usually like that. Um, so for the next question, um, I'm not gonna reveal the answer right now, but I just want to hear the appropriateness of the narrator's language. Right? Comment on that. Was it appropriate? I mean, what do you think about it? I want to hear more answers this time than the last one. What is what about the appropriateness of the narrator's language? Hmm. 
She was speaking, speaking Creole. Yeah, Miss, she was in the second part. She was speaking Creole because um, she is happy that um, she is able to leave and, and, and migrate and having gotten her visa. Uh, and so, but in her case, right, speaking Creole, it's, it's, it's um, I don't want to say hypocritical. It's not hypocritical as a word. It was a case of you're, you're trying to be pretentious of the, the extract. You're, you're speaking only standard English and you're complaining about the country, but then as soon as you get a chance to leave, you have reverted back to Jamaica. So it's like a lot of persons um, who want to migrate, they will act as if they are better than the persons who want to stay, right? And then when they go abroad now and they realize that they can't fit in, they have to revert back to um, Patwa and to build community among other persons who have migrated. So that is, is a social dimension about like belongingness um, and togetherness, right? So um, that is also something that should come out in, in your answers. Economical factor um, can't be an answer due to the comparison of both countries. Yeah, I mean, countries are differently economically developed and I'm sure that impacts upon education and, and so on. Um, appropriate use of Creole to create a casual setting in the hairdresser. Yeah. Um, Pinky, is she using, um, someone has asked me directly, a miscellaneous variety? Yes, I would say so. So that is something that we, we also have to um, go through. Acrylic, you know how it is already. Acrylic, miscellaneous, basilic. Um, you know, acrylic is at the top. That is the one that is furthest away from the dialect. Misalek is like in the middle, a mixture of um, both English Creole and, well, English, standard English and Creole. And then Basilek is like the base, like closest to Patwa. Um, some persons would say that if you go in certain parts of, of the country that are more rural, you will hear nothing but Creole dialect. Right, you're not going to hear anything of standard English. That is the closest thing that there is to, to a basilic. Um, setting is informal. Use of Creole is appropriate. Yeah, I mean, they're in a, they're in a, um, a beauty parlor. So you don't expect to speak standard English. Um, we read some other responses. Appropriateness of the language it also affects non-West Indians who read the extra as the appropriateness would affect them because they don't understand Creole. Yeah, that's true. I mean. As they are all Caribbean students doing a Caribbean exam. So an English student is not going to have any context of understanding any of this. So you're right about that. Since it's consultative voice, um, it's appropriate. Changing dialectal variations shows emotion and viewpoint further to explaining the story to the reader. Yeah, that's also acceptable um, and accurate. So let's see what the, the answer says. Appropriateness of the narrator's language. So they use two types of language in the extra Creole and standard English. Creole and standard English are both appropriate as they not only outline two different views on what culture is, but feelings. So somebody mentioned dialectal variations. So suggests that both can be used as a form of communication. And towards the end, even Pinky abandoned her use of standard English to express her joy, thus revealing the characteristics and pleasures of both languages. So it's situation, um, everybody will appreciate that we use language in under different circumstances. So when we want to express emotion and we are overjoyed and we're happy and, and so on, right? We, we use, um, we're more likely to use patwa and we're more likely to use um, Creole to, to express that. It's like if you go to a stage play, you're not going to, um, it's going to be boring if you use um, standard English or if you want to tell your friend a story that happened um, right, in typical Jamaican fashion, something um, happened you know, on, the, on the road that you just want to recount. You can't tell a story in standard English because it's going to be boring and people are not going to really listen to you. Right? So that's what it, it is saying. Like it, it is showing the difference in emotion between the two. Um, right when when Pinky was saying, "Oh, um, the island is full of strikes and power outages and and water lockoffs and so on," like she's saying it in a bit condescending, um, you know. So she's speaking standard English and she's saying, "No, I need to get out of here." So you know, like you put on ears and you are 
kind of acting hoity toity, um, right? So it those are examples if you make reference to them in the answer that you should be um, comfortable using um, explaining that. So for C, whether Pinky's language is motivated by linguistic and or non-linguistic factors. So I want to hear some of the answers. What are linguistic and non-linguistic factors? Some persons mention a couple, a couple of them, um, but let's discuss it formally here. Okay. What are they? What are linguistic and non-linguistic factors? What are examples of them? I'm, I'm looking out in the chat for any of the answers. Hmm? Cultural influences, phonology, um, linguistic and non-linguistic factors, examples. Um, okay, so in terms of non-linguistic factors, yeah, the culture, um, phonology would be linguistic. Shame that people attach to Creole, that's not non-linguistic, yeah. So those are all um, examples. and. Uh, <clears throat> so, and in the extract, was it more linguistic or non-linguistic? Um, we can see that it's mostly, it is non-linguistic because somebody mentioned social factors. Those had played a, a bigger role in all of these cultural differences and so on. Non-linguistic is like, yeah, language, attitude and habits, things like social factors like education and geography and um, setting and, and those things, determine our use of language. Right? Whereas linguistic factors are things like grammar, um, spelling, vocabulary, phonology, all of those things. Um, so Pinky's language is basically motivated by non-linguistic factors. As evident from the beginning, Pinky does not look at the fact that standard English has good grammar, nor the way that the words are pronounced. See, as I was saying, those are linguistic factors. Grammar, diction, vocabulary, spelling, things like that. All of those are linguistic that deal with the language itself whereas non-linguistic are more things like social factors attitudes culture um, right she uses standard english not because of anything to do with the language at all it's literally because i think english is better because it is civilized it is um it has <clears throat> it sounds better it's more appropriate a person's language is motivated by non-linguistic factors when they use it in a way that has nothing to do with the language at all. But it is related to attitude, education, geography, like I was saying. In such a case, the person just chooses a language because it suits him or her in the situation. And that's evident when, with Pinky. In the end, Pinky only used Creole because she now sees it as a way of expressing her joy at getting a visa, right? So, it's literally just expressive. It has nothing to do with the fact that she's used Creole because of how it sounds. Um, somebody raise their hand. You can go ahead. Oh, yes, sir. And it could also be because um, of their mother language, why they use the language. Right? Mm. <clears throat> the, the, mother uh, language? the mother tongue, the mother tongue, basically. Oh, you're saying that is um, non-linguistic. Right? Yes, sir. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's another another dimension of it. But doesn't think you have a linguistic factor such as her code switch? Yeah, she does. Um, but remember, for the most part, it is for the most part it is non-linguistic. So you can mention that, but the, the um, what's the word? The overwhelming evidence points to the fact that it is really non-linguistic. So that is just a, a very minor part of the answer, the fact that she's um, using it, um, code switching. Uh, code switching is, is linguistic, uh, but then again, you have to look at the reasons why do people code switch. In her case, she's code switching because um, she sees it as a better way of expressing herself. It has nothing to do with, um, you know, I'm using English because it is more appropriate in this setting or Creole because it's 
better in this setting or whatever the case might be, right? She's literally Creole because it's a better way of expressing um, her, her thing, right? So, um, sir, could you repeat that you were breaking up? And, uh, I was saying in response to um, one of the comments that said the code switching is it linguistic? Um, it is linguistic in this in this sense, right? Um, and it 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 is, but for the overwhelming majority of the answer that we are concerned here with non-linguistic factors. So even though you can just briefly mention it, like on, mention it on the side, but this the majority of this explanation is dealing with um, non-linguistic factors, right? And even if you mention code switching, you have to mention the reason for code switching. So why does Pinky code switch to Creole? Because she feels that um, it is better, a better way of expressing her joy in getting her visa, right? Um, so if you mention that, you have to also mention why. why. Why would she prefer English in some cases? English because it is, she wants to give an air of superiority. Um, she wants to show that she's more educated and, and more fit to migrate, whatever the case might be. But just be careful that if you introduce something new, you have to be able to just... And <clears throat> the last question in questions like this says, ways in which a video presentation of this interaction will help to highlight the fact that these are Caribbean speakers communicating in a Caribbean setting. This is always a question in language and community. They ask you, how would a skit or a play or something, a television um, acting or whatever, help to highlight that these are Caribbean speakers communicating in a Caribbean setting, right? Um, so I want to hear some answers in the chat. How would it help? Uh, I want to hear. So just think about it, like think about it as a, as a skit or a play. Um, and we, we are literally demonstrating what has happened here in text on screen. Uh, or on television or in the theater, and and how would it help to to highlight it? What are some of the things that would that would show somebody um, in this thing that they are from the um, Caribbean and that we're dealing with a Caribbean? So, tone, visualize body movements and facial expressions, variation in tone, gestures. Body language, body language. Um, okay, by stones and so on. So you know you have the, the right idea. So the audience will get to see the non-verbals, right? They see the gesticulation um, used by Pinky and Miss Daisy, um, right? The hand movements and and so on. Just imagine you're watching a play and they're in a barbershop setting or they're in a beauty parlor setting, you know, doing their hair and nails and so on. It would clarify, bring clarity as it would not only appeal to the ears, but to the sight. Then you think of costumes and you think of props and just think of all the elements that you would have in a stage play and just, and why it would help to enhance the situation. The props would give a particular setting that tells us that the speakers are from the Caribbean. You know, just imagine a, a typical um, hair salon, um, nail salon. Costumes would be an appropriate means of suggesting the way each of the women treat languages they use. Um, it is obvious that Pinky would not dress a certain way and she uses standard English, so she might dress more formally, um, a formal skirt or, or something. And then Miss Daisy would, would dress um, more uh, informally, more loosely, right? So in-depth understanding non-verbal, non-verbal um, mm -hmm. uh, non gestures affiliated with the Caribbean and only things that we can understand as persons from the Caribbean. Um, body language and uh, and so on. So everybody is on the right track. Just anything visual is what we would be concerned with here. All right. So that's the, the first one. It was a bit long, a bit longer than I um, hoped for. But the the second one, now that we have a, a taste of what the first one is, the second one will be easier to go. Um. So this is you now from two thousand and six. A very a shorter extract. Um, shorter extracts. Yeah. Same same sir, author. Mm -hmm. So a question about the so now would we write out the specific um facial expression, body language, and etc. and explain why is it so? I mean, yeah, you can. It, it's it helps to be specific. So if you can be as specific as possible, 
then um, I would suggest that you, you you do that instead of just saying, oh, body language and expression. But, but you, you don't have to be, but it, it helps to get more marks, more detail here. Right? Okay, sir. Okay. All right, so the next one now, um, this extract. So Natasha was very intelligent, almost unchildlike and Andrea felt at a loss. She didn't know how to talk to children who didn't particularly act like children, didn't know what tone to adopt, what subject might be good. She said, do you like dolls? And Natasha said, when I grow up, I'm going to be an astronaut. Andrea hadn't heard that one before. Doctor, teacher, nurse, and policeman, she was used to, but not astronaut, especially not from a child, probably never been further than Kingston. She felt herself pitying the child for being so ambitious, um, would never be fulfilled. She said, that's a good question. Why do you want to do that? So I can float around my teacher. My teacher says there's no gravity in space, so you have to float. They showed a movie at school about it, and I know that's what I want to do. Andrea burst out laughing. How many people were there who wanted to float? Natasha was staring at her, and she tried to stop laughing, swallowed hard. Natasha said, what are you going to be, a doctor? No, Andrea said, I'm studying languages, you know. French and Spanish. I'll probably teach when I graduate. Oh, she was unimpressed and Andrea felt a little. Natasha spoke good English, which was strange because her mother knew only dialect. When Mrs. Jackson brought Natasha, she had tried to speak properly, but Andrea knew it was beyond her. She herself spoke Creole to the woman to put her at ease. But Mrs. Jackson had been insulted. She left quickly telling Natasha she'd be back for her at one o'clock. Right? So adopted from Alisa McKenzie, Natasha, in the same book as the previous extract. So I'll read it again, but just to, um, you know, groups everybody. It's, so Natasha is a, is a child. Andrea is apparently her caregiver, her, um, you know, her nanny, her helper for the day. And Mrs. Jackson is Natasha's mother. Um, she dropped her off. And Natasha is speaking to Andrea, who is a university student. And Andrea, you know, she doesn't know how to talk to this child who seems so intelligent for her age, right? They, they call that, she's precocious. She seems, she's um, not acting like a child. She's not interested in dolls and, and those things. She's just talking about her career and, and things that will get her ahead in life and what have you. So Natasha was very intelligent, almost unchildlike, and Andrea felt at a loss. She didn't know how to talk to children who didn't particularly act like children didn't know what tone to adopt, what subject might be good. She said, do you like dolls? And Natasha said, when I grow up, I'm going to be an astronaut. Andrea hadn't heard that one before. Doctor, teacher, nurse, and policeman, she was used to, but not astronaut, especially not from a child who'd probably never been further than Kingston. She felt herself pitying the child for being so ambitious, would never be fulfilled. She said, that's a good profession. Why do you want to do that? so I can float around. My teacher says there's no gravity in space, so you have to float. They showed a movie at school about it. And I know that's what I want to do. Andrea burst out laughing. How many people were there who wanted to float? Natasha was staring at her and she tried to stop laughing, swallowed hard. Natasha said, what are you going to be a doctor? No, Andrea said, I'm studying languages, you know, French and Spanish. I'll probably teach when I graduate. Oh, she was unimpressed and Andrea felt little. Natasha spoke good English, which was strange because her mother knew only dialect. When Mrs. Jackson brought Natasha, she had tried to speak properly, but Andrea knew it was beyond her. She herself spoke Creole to the woman to put her at ease, but Mrs. Jackson had been insulted. Um, she left quickly, telling Natasha she'd be back for her at one o'clock. Um, so, Natasha, um, let's go to the first question. An essay of no more than five hundred words discussed a Natasha's possible motivation for achieving a good command of the English language. Okay. So remember, at the end it says that Natasha spoke good English, um, but her mother knew only dialect. So Andrea found that strange. I said, "How did this child know such good English, and yet she's around her mother so often who doesn't know good English?" So why would not? What would be Natasha's reason for wanting to achieve a good command? Of the Yeah, you're right. Discussion between Andrea and Natasha, a primary school student. Um, her education could be an impact on her, her language. Um, mm -hmm. Ambition, 
yeah, I mean, she's clearly bright and young. She's ambitious. She wants to study to be an astronaut. And so she basically would have done a lot of reading and, and paid attention in school and, and education and so on. She wants to get ahead in life. Right? So you know, see the answers there. She wants to be an astronaut. She knows that a good commander in English should be best suited for such a profession. She seems smart. It is clear that she can recall what her teacher says, which suggests her ability to learn and to speak well. So you see, she's one of those students who pays attention in class and they do their work and, and so on. So they are, um, so Natasha is clearly above, um, above average in terms of her, in terms of her um, ability, right? Let me read some more of the responses. Motivation, her career choice. Yes, that's what that was said. Mother, yeah, that's another one. Maybe her mother didn't want you to speak like her, so she can still so she can speak a certain way. Uh, yes, you, you do have that. Uh, parents want their children to turn out better than they did, right? So she herself might knows that she doesn't speak um, English, have a good grasp of the English language, but she also um, wouldn't encourage her, like, you know, turn out, I send it to school because I want it to be better than me. Um, so her mother might have motivated her as well as being around people who speak the language, you can adapt, yes. So at, let's say that Natasha spends most of her time with people and persons who are career oriented like her. She's gonna pick up some of those behaviors and habits. I know she sees her mother is, is treated for speaking Creole, yeah, because um, Andrea switched to Creole because she felt that she would be better able to understand her in that. Um, you know, by, by, but then she felt insulted by it, okay? just saying, oh, um, you think I'm dunce, I don't know English language. So um, it's better to just speak English so that I know that you are educated, so that people treat me different. That, that could also have been a possible motivation, but definitely not limited to those, um, you know, that, that are listed here as the answer. So I'm running slightly behind time. So let's move on to fast talk. Any possible justification for Andrea's surprise that Natasha spoke English so well? So basically, why why was Andrea surprised that Natasha spoke English so well? Why? Why did it come as such a big surprise? And I have one of the answers there already. Um, stereotyping, yeah. Her background, her age, yes. Because she was young, like, it's a good child, like, you're speaking better English than most um, persons who are way older than you. Like, how oh, oh, are you this good? Her background, yes, because um, I, he, she had never been further than Kingston. That's what that was mentioned. Yeah, I completely missed that, right? And her mother spoke only dialect, um, you know, because uh, she had never been, when she says that she has been never further than Kingston, right? It's not to say that she has never been to other parts of Jamaica. It's to say that she has never been out of the country. Right? So she has never been out of the country. How is she speaking standard English better than English people? Right? Um, so her background, her level of education, and her age. She was just a child. No child knew, um, she knew had such aspiration or even knows how to speak so well. And Natasha was a primary school student, right? As opposed to Andrea, who is at university, and yet she's putting most university people to shame. Like she speaks better than uh, most university students, right? Her inspiration of being an, an astronaut. Um, children adopt from their environment and her mother didn't speak standard English. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. Especially from a child who had never been past Kingston because her mother um, spoke Creole and because she was here. So everybody seems to have it um, in terms of why the, the answer to this particular question. Right, so moving right along. Um, okay, yeah, good answer. What Mrs. Jackson's behavior reveals about her attitude to the use of Creole? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. What does Mrs. Jackson's behavior reveal about her attitude to the use of Creole? Yeah, she literally, um, you know, she started to speak to her in Creole because she spoke in Creole and she found that very degrading, very insulting. Um, yeah, shame, discrimination, stigma, stereotype, all of those things happen. And then she said, she just cut her off and said, no, I'm, I'm gonna come back to you o'clock or whatever the time. Right? Cause, she, and, Cause she just feel shame, it's just, 
Um, right? So she thinks it's very degrading. She was insulted. Trying to speak properly suggests that she links English to being cultured and Creole as uncivilized. Um, and her embarrassment is revealed in her leaving as quickly as possible. See, like she just get up and I'm just gone. I can't take this. Right. Um, I remember, like I said in the first essay, they, um, they usually ask you a question to show you the dichotomy between speaking English and speaking Creole. In this case, we can see that speaking English is linked to being civilized and to being cultured and to being proper, but Creole is uncivilized. It is um, barbaric. It is not something to be generally accepted by people. Um, right? She doesn't approve, shame, she's emb embarrassment, um, all of those things. So everybody is, is correct, insult, shame, and so on, um, right? And the last question, you probably saw a bit of it, but it's the same as the, the previous one. How would communication be enhanced through a video presentation of this? And you can bet that a question like that will come and you, you know, even without reading the extract itself or knowing what it is about, you know what, um, what the answers are. So just, um, just say them in the chat and let, let's run through them a little bit. Right. Just like with the, the, the barbershop example, the, the, um, not the barbershop, the hair salon example. How would a video presentation help in demonstrating this? this Body language, gestures, mm -hmm. um, facial expression, disbelief as her eyes broaden, her eyebrows being raised as she had a different perception of Natasha that spoke only Creole. Yeah, that's a good one. It's very specific. Non-communicative behaviors. Andrea's surprise can be shown. Um, <laughs> Somebody asking a question or the um, body language um, when she left quickly, fa um, facial expressions, communication were enhanced through body language, gestures, different attitudes shown in Andrea's English. So everybody is, is correct with, with that one. So communication could be enhanced, nonverbal. And don't forget um, costumes and props, those are always in there as well. Just think of a play, a stage play. So not just the, the movements, but the visuals, the lighting, the, um, the costumes, the props, and, and, um, and those things that are on the stage that we can see. So nonverbal forms, costumes, we see how characters react to changes. Like Mrs. Jackson, she was first happy when she was trying to speak English and became sad. Props behind them, so just the perfect setting. One which has not mentioned in this scene. Nonverbal forms of communication reveal more that would give meaning behind words. Audience will get to see how Natasha reveals her unimpressed attitude to Andrea's future occupation, or how Andrea would look at Natasha curiously as she speaks. And more importantly, the audience would see how embarrassed Mrs. Jackson would have been given that she did not say so, right? Um, video presentation, non-West Indians, body language, as a way of communication, they would understand because of the switch of dialect would probably confuse them. Um, okay, yeah. And a look of frustration on her face as her diction was faulty. Yeah, I like, um, I like all of those, um, Natasha's facial expression would be showing pride and joy when she wanted to be an astronaut. Um, yeah, they left quickly and oh, she just, left um, when she felt insulted. So all of those, this is a good one to show as a video presentation and you're all correct in, in that um, regard. So I like all of, all of those answers. And let's go through the next one very, very quickly. Um, but like I said, once you've done one, you, are, you know how to do the rest. So you should be able to breeze through the next one, basically. Um, this one is, is a poem, and uh, it's taken from Earl Mackenzie, A Tale of Two Tongues. Cecil Gray is bite in, see? and uh, so we just read it, A Tale of Two Tongues. So, Miss Ida speaks only English to God. Scholars cannot follow the diction of her graces and prayers. To her, it is the language of holy things and the giver of commandments. It deserves a grammar of respectability, as firm and as polished as his tablets of stone. But to fellow mortals, she speaks Creole. 
the tongue of the markets and fields, the language of labrish, susu, proverbs and stories, hot words, tracings and preke. It is the way to get hard ears picking to listen and face the men to keep off. It is the tongue of belly laughs and sweet money. And to Miss Ida, it is no bother to laugh and suffer in one language and worship in another. Okay. Um, very short poem to show that Miss Ida practically speaks. When she's praying, she speaks only English. When she's um, going about her everyday life, she speaks only um, standard. Well, she speaks Creole to everybody else. Okay. So let's let's go through it again. Um, so Miss Ida speaks only English to God. Scholars cannot follow the diction of her praises and prayers. To her, it is the language of holy things and giver of commandments. Deserves a grammar of respectability as firm and as polished as his tablets of stone. But to fellow mortals, she speaks Creole, the tongue of the markets and fields, the language of labrish, susu, proverbs and stories, hot words, tracings and preke. It is the way to get hard ears picking to listen and face the men to keep off. It is the tongue of belly laughs and sweet body action. And to Miss Ida, it is no bother to laugh and suffer in one language and worship in another. So we see a duality there, um, a clear contrast. Like she says, it's no bother to laugh and suffer in one language and to um, worship in another, right? And the question is the same as it is in an essay of no more than 500 words. And like I said, if you can write the essay, at least write the points and explain them, they'll mark it the same way if you find that you're running out of time. Um, so the difference in the language in stanzas one and two. So, so talk to me, what are some of the, the differences? We see that in the first stanza, she's literally talking about how she speaks proper English to God, right? And it has to be so good that it deserves a grammar of respectability as firm and polished as his tablets of stone, right? Um, it's the language of the holy things, of graces and prayers, but to mortals, fellow mortals beneath her and beneath, uh, well, beneath God, along with her, she's talking the language of labrish, labrish is gossip, um, susu, proverbs, stories, all of the things that people like to be animated about, tracings, hot words, how she tell, um, face the men to keep off, how she, um, it has some other uses like to tell hard ears, pick me to listen. It is the, the kind of language that you use in belly laughs. So I just, you know, want confirmation that everybody is seeing the, the same thing. First is formal and elegant. Second is laid back and familiar. Yeah, and that, that's acceptable. Um, difference is made clear by the distinctive characteristics that each um, have with respect to pronunciation, lexicon, and syntax. Language in standard one is standard English, and stanza two is a combination of Creole and standard English. So, um, yeah, formal language used to respect the Supreme being. She used standard language, standard English as the language of holy things, believes that by speaking it, it is respectable. Right? So everybody sees that clearly. Um, and don't forget to remember, if you're speaking about the difference in language, you have to speak about things like linguistic stuff. So pronunciation, lexicon, syntax, right? Vocabulary, diction, grammar, spelling, all of those things look at the differences and talk about those differences, right? So we clearly see the difference between formal and informal, okay? All right, um, B, the attitudes to English and Creole as um, revealed in the poem. So what are, what are the attitudes to English? So we've spoken about the difference in the language, but what is, what is the particular attitude to English and the particular um, attitude to Creole? She compares her standardized English as the language of God compared to Creole, also compares how great her standard English is. Okay, um, yeah. So she gives apparent one, like a reverence to English, right? She gives like this deference and reverence to English as it being the greatest kind of thing, um, you know, and Whereas for Patwa, it's she literally describes it as this line um, tells you everything that, yeah, that you need to know about it, how she thinks about it, right? To fellow mortals, she speaks Creole, the tongue of markets and fields. So it's like the average man in society. Um, somebody raise a hand, you can go ahead. Uh, sir, I was just asking if it's a case where she prays English more than how she would for Creole. 
yes, she, say, she prays almost exclusively in English, only in English. Um, never prays in Creole, and only uses Creole with um, her fellow mortals, human beings. She degrades Creole um, in a sense, yes, because she uses Creole only for um, basic interactions, like with the members of society who are, who are regular like her. Um, and yes, she views Creole as a superior language. Um, you know, is there any other way for persons who are not in the WhatsApp group to keep up um, to when you're having classes because WhatsApp group is full? Um, well, this class is going to end in, in the next hour. Um, the WhatsApp group, I think, question is probably better directed to organizers. Um, in in um, NJF. Uh, I this is supposed to be made available for everybody. I know that everybody can't really attend, can't really see the WhatsApp group. So, but on YouTube or, or wherever it is, no nobody can get um, shot. Everybody will um, be able to access the questions and the answers. Um, okay, so attitudes to English and Creole. So it is clear that the person I uses English and Creole. It's clear that she attaches different attitudes to each. So she sees standard English as a language of the gods. She believes that only God is worthy enough for, his, um, for this language. Creole is the, is the language of basically everything else, laughs, suffering, cursing off, tracing, and so on. It is good enough to speak to all men, but not to God. It is the tongue of markets and fields. Putting aside, but keeping in mind how the person views this language, we can attach the attitudes to how it is viewed in general. English is viewed as a civilized language that people use in formal situations. People believe that it is a proper way of communicating. Creole is therefore an uncivilized way of speaking. It is a language of markets and fields. It is informal and uncivilized. And we've seen that repeated so many times. It literally says, among my mere more, and you can, in a question like this, you would have to make reference to the poem. Either you write out the, the line or you, um, you, write the, the number of the, the of the poem. It, you can do well with the number as well, because see, the numbers are, are there in this one. See, 5, 10, 15, 20, since it's a poem, not like the others, which were um, continuous prose. So you say in line this, in line that, and they will make reference to it. So um, we see that the attitudes sharply contrast, sharply differ. And for C, which is the, the last question, is it? yeah, C is the last question in this one, and then we, we pause again. How a televised reading of this poem could enhance its meaning? Same thing like the, the ones before. Um, we see how the poet expresses himself as he changes from stanza one to stanza two. We would see the contrast. So like we, we're talking um, regular English as opposed to now um, we're going to something that is more um, laid back and informal, right? We would see the way the poet uses and pronounces the words. We would treat both languages the same way which can help us to understand, determine the attitude attached to both languages. And then now you think about the visual stuff. So you, you look at in the second paragraph, especially how can we um, demonstrate this in a way that people are going to understand. So labrish, proverb stories, gossip, just have visuals um, of those persons talking um, in the ways like that, the tracings and the preke and the hot words and the hard ears, pickney and um, cussing off the man and telling him to back off and stuff. The belly laughs, the body action, um, the markets and the fields. You show the markets, you show the fields. There are so many ways you could put all of this into television and it would adequately convey the meaning, right? Um, let me read some of the answers here. Yeah, putting quotations. Yeah, putting quotations when given from the passage, examples. Proverbs in this context mean the Bible. No, proverbs like Jamaican proverbs, um, not necessarily proverbs from the, from the Bible. Um, referring, she's referring to standard English as being the superior language, is inferior. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, bias towards standard English. So everybody is on the same page. Um, so remember the questions, the order of how it is, it's not the language and community, this module practically asks you, um, what are the attitudes to language 
what are the linguistic and non-linguistic factors? What are the social factors determining language, use of language? What is the comparison and contrast? Why is Creole used as opposed to standard English and when? And then the last question in this uh, module is always something related to how a visual presentation, a televised reading of this poem, um, a play or anything like that, how would it help to actually um, convey the meaning that is being demonstrated, right? Um, so I think that's us for this module. And we're gonna take another five, ten, 10 minutes, probably five. Yeah, let's take a five minutes. We don't really need 10 minutes for this one because the last module, module three is very short. It's the shortest of all of them. Uh, same three questions that we're gonna go through. Um, it's just speaking and writing. So let's get back to that at 25. I have, I have 12.20 on my, on my clock. But yeah, whatever, whenever it is, 12.25. Um, let's give it five minutes. So anybody who might have dropped out, let's tell them don't stay, um, stay too far from the, the computer or the phone. And we'll be back at 12. Um, okay, so it's best to write the essay, just to answer this, this question. It's best to write the essay. Only if you're running out of time, then you can put them in, in points. Okay. All right, module one is gathering and processing information. That is the first one that we did. Gathering and processing information. Um, module two, language and community. Module three, um, speaking and writing. All right. Um, good afternoon again, everybody. We're ready to resume and. Uh, Hope that most of you are, are still with us. So 25, almost finished. I know that you might be tired. Yeah, it's Sunday, uh, exam season. Let's try and push through. I only have about maybe 40 or so minutes left. But this last one is actually, it's very short. Um, it's a short, design. same marks, same number of marks, 25 marks, um, but you have more control over, over this question. It's about speaking and writing. You're given a very short scenario and you're asked how would you respond to it basically by just using the elements of communication. So I won't bother to ask what, um, well, we can discuss what the answers are, um, but I'm not going to hide the answers um, in, in this one. So, persons are still with us can just indicate that they are here and if you are ready for us to begin. Um, well, writing is untidy if the examiner is going to take off marks. They shouldn't. Um, ideally, we'd hope that they don't, but try and write as clearly and as legibly as possible so that you, you don't run into any problems with them. Some of them can, can be vindictive, we'll never know, but just let their lives be easier. Um, it's bad enough that they can't read some handwriting already, so try not to, to make it worse. Um, right, so let us just begin. All right, so very short scenario. You are a member of an environment protection group that is concerned about shipments of nuclear waste Caribbean waters. Your group is trying to sensitize persons in the community to the potential threat and persuade them to join a march. So first question in this one is indicate an appropriate channel and medium that would, you would use for the above purpose and compose your presentation. Right? Um, so everybody knows the difference between channels and mediums, right? So channel, like whether it's written, um, broadcast, spoken, medium, is like the actual thing, is it television, is it newspaper, or so on. Um, but I know you can see the answer, but are there any other answers that you think are acceptable for something um, like this? 
So we see that one might use a written channel that will carry a medium such as a gleaner, letter to the editor, or a spoken channel where the medium may be a general meeting or a speech. So remember, we're dealing with the elements of communication here in this last one, okay? it's speaking and writing. That is the name of the module, speaking and writing. So I want to see in the chat, I realize we have fewer persons here, so I don't want to go on too long because it, diminishing returns will start to set in. We want to pass a few minutes. So talk to me. Are there any other channels and mediums you would use for this presentation? You're a member of an environment protection group concerned about shipments of nuclear waste, and you want to sensitize persons in the community to the potential threat. Remember that. This question was written in 2003, it's almost 20 years ago. You never have social media at that time. You never have um, smartphones at that time, right? So you can be more creative. Yeah, it's not just limited to traditional media, right? Um, so communication has changed vastly since that time. So talk to me. Um, remember the difference. The channel is, the, is whether it is written, spoken, um, you know, visualized or whatever. The medium is the actual physical thing through which it is conveyed. So the medium is the gleaner, the newspaper, the television, the meeting, speech, whatever it may be. Flyers, yes, flyers, most persons seem to be saying flyers. Radio, television, um, what else persons are, are saying? Town crier, yes, in the community, you know, you have the the um, the car and the the, speakers on the top and the, the, the tone crowd the recording of them played videos um, of the effects, you know, posters, most persons saying flyers, yes, because anything sensitization. Remember, the best thing about module three is that the answers here are always standard, literally. Just think about ways in which you would convey something. And then the next part of the question is saying, um, how would you compose your presentation? Like, you're not, so they're not asking you to actually write. Um, well, this one asks you to compose, but we're not going to write the actual thing. In the exam, you would have to write the actual message that you want to show to everybody, right? But in this case, just tell me what you would write. What are some of the things you would write in your message? Right? Don't write the actual message. Just tell me some of the things you would write. Like in composing your um, presentation, think about what you would you ought to write. The question mentions shipments of nuclear waste through Caribbean waters. So introduce the listeners and readers about those shipments. After that, make sure what the readers are well informed. Where are they coming from? What are the nuclear wastes? How harmful can it be? How can it impact on the lives of the Caribbean, both people and animals? Um, and remember to be persuasive. So the, the best thing about um, module three, why people tend to breeze through it is because um, in module three, people go back to module one for a lot of the answers because they're going to ask you what are some of the strategies and techniques, the language strategies, um, the language techniques and the organizational strategies and stuff that you would use, right? Um, so what are some of those that, they, that, they would, um, that you would use? Just talk to me, just put it in the chat and, and, and let's discuss it. I haven't shown everything yet. You see rhetorical questions is, is one of them. But what are some of the techniques that you would use in your presentation? That's all it's asking for. That's why I said that most persons who tend to get stuck, when you get stuck, if you get stuck or you don't have any time, and time is running over you in this module, just go back to module one and go back to the question that was asked about the language strategies and the organizational techniques and the things that you wrote in that answer. Just go back there and then um, and write the answers from there. So yeah, logos, and we have logos, ethos, pathos, appeal to people, emotions, um, use of details, um, examples, appeal to emotion, the message would appeal to them. Yes, everybody seems to get that, right? That how it's appeal to them emotionally, right? Something else, think about the lives of animals living in Caribbean waters. Um, mm -hmm. You can make a, by social media, in the case of the younger demographic who don't usually read newspaper, newspaper for the older demographic. Mm -hmm. Um, what else is, is being said? Would highlight the impact it has on the waters. Yeah, pathos, one for emotion. Yeah, logos, sorry. Lo logos is the one that appeals to logic. Pathos is the, is the one for emotion. Um, right, so 
everybody seems to say that we're trying to appeal emotionally. Yeah, because it's a sensitive environmental um, issue and we want to, to get people aware. And then you, you show nuclear waste, how it's affecting the wildlife. Um, you know, those very emotional videos that tug at people's heartstrings and say, oh, we can be so heartless. Let us save the, um, the, let us save them and so on and so forth, right? So that is really what is being asked of you. How would you compose such a presentation? Rhetorical questions, authoritative sources, statistical data, any evidence like show images if you can. Um, you know, the, the effect that it have on, has on wildlife and how it has on fauna and flora, um, statistical data, authoritative sources, farm and register, all of that. Um, and a point about, you know, authoritative sources. So you're in an exam and the examiner doesn't expect you to really know any real scientist that knows about nuclear waste. So you can make up stuff. Like you can literally make up names, make up um, the year that it was published, make up the journal that it was published in. The point is that they want to understand that you know how to convey the fact that this is uh, an, an issue that uh, an, an authoritative source can speak on. So you can say, according to James Smith, the research of aquatic life in the Caribbean, who is James Smith? We don't know, we don't care. You're in an exam, the aim is to prove that someday in the future you can make a presentation and be, be free to make up as many statistics and sources as you want or need. And so just be free to, to make up anything, um, literally. The point is just show. Just asking everybody again to mute, mute your mics. Um, just show that you can um, present, right? Just make up the name, make up the year, make up the statistics. 5,000 and odd, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Just put it in there. We have to give examples of the images, so like show birds um, covered in nuclear waste. Yeah, like you just write what it is that you would show. Right? You, you can't draw images and show images and stuff in the exam. So just give examples of it. Yeah, that is perfectly fine. Right? Um, right? Use using these guidelines. Write your presentation. Um, write a paragraph explaining the appropriateness of your composition. It's very important as it brings the readers and the listeners the harms of nuclear waste. Persuasive, informative, most persons send appeal to emotion, conversational, tone is very pleasant, register is very formal, making it appeal to everybody. Readers are therefore made to understand the main point and the overall purpose. Not only that, they um, would also act towards and do something about it. So this question, it asks, write a paragraph explaining the appropriateness of your composition, right? Appropriateness of your composition. Um, so you just, this is just asking you to explain what it is that you would do and why it is um, appropriate, right? So why did I choose um, this tone? Why did I choose this register? Why did I choose these words, right? Um, what, what, what is my main point trying to say? And why is it that I chose to appeal to, to emotion? Do I think it's going to be effective? That's all you're doing right here. You're just explaining all of that in this piece. Okay. Um, so we talk about the effects it has on fishermen and the revenue from fish selling fishes, death, contamination of aquatic life, left without a job. Yeah, like all of that is fine. Like um, for the previous question, yeah, like to show the impacts of nuclear waste in the Caribbean and why it is the way it is. Yeah, that's fine. Be as detailed as possible, like be as graphic as possible because you're trying to appeal to emotions and you want your, your thing to sensitize this issue to persons to be as effective as possible. That's fine. Be as detailed as possible, right? So that's, that's the first one. Move on to the next one. Um, so... 2004, your community market has just been renovated and vendors and authorities are quite pleased with the results. However, at a management meeting, the need for vendors to cooperate with the authorities to maintain the market's cleanliness has been raised. So you have been approached to conduct a campaign to make vendors aware of their responsibilities. So you are well aware that the subject matter must be handled in a delicate manner. 
right? Remember the scenario, like this is how short it is. It doesn't give you a scenario and you're, you're asked to answer certain questions based on that scenario. The first question is, discuss the approach you would take in creating the campaign, just like the previous one, in terms of the communication challenges you would expect to find when targeting the vendors. So before I reveal the answer, just put it in the chat or raise your hand. What are some of the challenges you would expect to find when you're targeting the vendors in this communications campaign? Anybody? Realize there are fewer and fewer persons in this. Um, they're dropping out of the, of the call. We're almost finished, guys. So for the persons who are still here, I hope that you stay until the end. Almost finished. So what are some of the, the, the challenges that you would expect? You are management and you're communicating with the vendors um, about the market's cleanliness and you want to let them know the vendors about their responsibilities, right? And you have to, remember they said, it must be handled in a delicate manner, delicate manner, literally meaning, um, you know, there has to be some amount of sensitivity in how you communicate with people because there is a certain difference that you have to take into consideration. So use of language, yes, language barrier, some vendors might be illiterate, so you want to use writing. writing. Um, some disabilities like visual and hearing impaired, some cannot read, intellectual um, disabilities, ensuring to speak a certain way that they can understand, right? All right, so that is really what they're asking you because we are assuming, whether wrongly or rightly, that um, a lot of the vendors are don't really have formal education so they're not able to communicate the same way as the persons in the in management so management has to take that into consideration um sir, so, mm -hmm. sir could you use like a mixture of standard english and Creole at the same time so that the vendors would like um have a people would take you seriously and see that you're um from you know yeah you can use authority a mixture is always best. Um, whichever way that you think will get the message across, and you have to explain why and justify why you think that using a mixture is better than using full standard English or using full cream. Right? So some of the challenges, deciding on the medium and the channel. Um, yes, some persons mentioned you wouldn't use mostly writing like posters, understanding the best way to communicate with the vendors in a delicate manner, um, what particular language should be used, um, how to make it very persuasive. So all of those things come into the choice of language that you would have used, the choice of the medium, the choice of the um, writing and so on. So we are, we are good with that. Um, in terms of the barriers to communication that we would expect um, B. So the information that must be relayed and the vocabulary and register that you would consider appropriate. So before I reveal the answer, just say it in the chat or raise your hand. What are some of the information that you put in your message and what vocabulary and register you would use? Register, remember, meaning formal, informal. Um, what is it? Remember, register as opposed to tone that we would use. Formal, yeah. All right, so you would use a formal because it's coming from management. You want to be taken seriously. So you will be formal. What about the information? What are the things that you would include in your message? What's the kind of vocabulary that you would use? Consultative, okay. In, um, instructive, basilect and acrylic. Um, okay, gives a possible um, uh, keeping the place sanitary, visual results of the effects of cleanliness. Um, okay, somebody mentioned that. Yeah, it's on a campaign. 
intersperse it with a little patter here and there, um, but not too much overly saturated with patwa because we want to keep the register as formal as possible. All right, so um, yeah, information that must be relayed, vocabulary and register that you consider appropriate. Um, so let me make sure to answer now. So things like the information, the register, um, sorry, the renovation of the market, importance of this renovation, the cost, the need for it to be maintained, the responsibilities of the vendors. Don't forget that. Remember, it said that you have been approached to conduct a campaign to make vendors aware of their responsibilities. So you have to tell them, you know, clean up um, here, put things in the in the bin, um, and so on. Things like that. They have responsibilities. Um, a brief idea of the consequences of them ignoring the warnings and their responsibilities. Okay, so all of those things you have to put into the message itself. All right, vocabulary. Vocabulary should be simple, it should be persuasive, and it should create seriousness in the message being said. It should avoid using words that the vendors don't understand as that would cause confusion and loss of interest. Posters with Creole, catchy Creole slogan, simple vocabulary, yeah. So that's what that, what that was said. Um, so everybody is, is on the right track, definitely. Um, and the register most persons said formal, so and it is said here, it should be very formal means that it should appeal to everyone since they are strangers. So it can't be informal because we don't, we don't speak to them like on a personal level, but we don't know them like that. And not, not everybody knows each other. You want to speak in a formal way that the message gets to, to, to everybody, right? Um, and uh, see any other organizational strategies as well as visual approaches you would employ. Some persons mentioned a few of them. Um, there anything else that you would that you would say? I mean, well, I mean, you kind of answered the, the, that question in the last question. The information should be persuasive. Posters would be around the market, reminding them of their responsibilities. Example, keep here clean. There will be monitoring of the facilities. Regular meetings will be organized. There will be the building of dumps around the market. And um, so visual stuff. Things that, that you can see happening. Posters was the one that everybody mostly said. Um, monitoring of the facilities, regular meetings um, would be organized. And when they said organizational strategies, they mean literal things like practical things that you would do, right? What are some of the things that you would do as part of the sensitization campaign, right? You want to keep regular meetings, you want to monitor the facilities, you put cameras in there, you put bins around the place. Um, so, what are the practical stuff that they're asking you? Everybody understands. Um, in which situations would you use an informal register? When you know everybody um, that you're communicating with, right? personally. So you wouldn't use informal when you're addressing an audience that you don't know each and every single. You have to use formal. When you're using, you use informal if you're like, you are, um, you're the head of a club at school or captain of a team or something. You're expected to know. Um, interact with everybody and your club meetings and you and and so on. Then it is safe to use informal in those situations. But if I am the mayor and I come to the market, I don't know most of these people. I don't interact with them every day. I have to use a formal register. But it's not a situation like that. All right. Um, so we we'll finish with that one. Of about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Um, so we'll move on to the very last question. No, last question. Um, I hope nobody else is because I see the numbers keep going. All right. So the Six Farm Association is a newly formed organization with a small membership. The members wish to embark on a recruitment mission. That's the prompt. Very simple, very short. Six Farm Association is a newly formed organization, a small membership. And the members wish to embark on a recruitment message. A, um, list three aspects of the communication process that the members should consider before they begin to create their recruitment message. Just type it in the chat. Everybody's supposed to know the communication process, by now, right? Um, you know, like what conceptualization, message channel, feedback. I mean, I guess I'm saying the answers for you already. Um, but so you would know aspects of the communication process that they should consider before they begin. 
right? Conceptualization of the message, the medium, the more effectiveness of the mode of sending the message, the channel, um, the feedback that they anticipate, um, and the noise and, and so on. So, so we know that. So select two of the aspects you have and explain the significance of each. So just put that in the chat. What is the significance of the conceptualizing the message? What's the significance of the medium? What's the significance of the channel? And so on. And like I said, this, one, this module, the last one, is easy, easy. You just breeze through it. It's worth the same number of marks as the first, 25 marks. So just, um, just say it in the chat. Um, tell me what's, what's going on. I see one, one response, decode, sender, feedback, yeah? Um, you know the communication process, so you, you should know this one by now. Um, all right, the medium is necessary. One wants to reach a wide cross-section of people, so you have to choose a medium that gets the message across. One must consider what's going to be in the message, what would appeal to people, significance of the conceptualization of the message. Um, this is what is going to start the communication process. And feedback. Um, right, next one, identify three means by which the members of the Sixth Farm Association can convey their message effectively. Just tell me three, three ways that they can, um, three media, I guess, three channels that they can convey their message effectively. Right. social media, social media, um, target or focus group. Yeah, I mean, that works if you're in a yeah, meetings, targets, focus group, because it's a six farm association, which is like all of you are in six farms. So most of you um, would know, but all you would know what, what is being um, conveyed here, right? So television broadcast, I mean, well, for six farm association, you wouldn't go that far, but notices, Flyers, pamphlets, posters, speech, presentations, radio. I mean, if you have school radio, probably internally, then that works. Um, B, so select two of the means that you have identified and explain why each can be used to convey the message effectively. So like, why are flyers, pamphlets, and posters effective? Why are speech presentations? You can have meetings in the hall or the auditorium with everybody. Why is that more effective than the rest? Just think about those things. So like I said, that television broadcast and radio broadcast wouldn't really be necessary unless it was internal. So, I mean, if you broadcast to the nation that um, XYZ High School is having, the Six Farm Association is having their thing, I don't think most persons would really care. So that, that is an ineffective way. So you want to say, why, why is social media effective? Um, yes, what about various social media groups and broadcast messages? That you have in WhatsApp and, and what have you, um, right? So, why? Tell me why they're effective. Flyers, speech presentation will get everybody's attention. You can reach a larger, younger audience using social media. Yeah, because every most persons, if not all, are supposed to be on some form of social media, at least. Um, okay, speech presentation is effective. This is allows some more personalized interaction with one's audience, prompt them to feel safe and be a part of the solution. And is that it? Yeah, that was the last question. So we are, we are finished um, with everything. So will there be another marathon session? We can go through 18 to 21. I'd love to if we were able to access it, but it's not up to me. Um, that's up to New Jamaica Foundation, so please, those organizational stuff, ask your organizers and let us see what we can do between now and the exam. I see a raised hand, you, you can go ahead. Excuse me, sir, can I say the last question, please? Oh, you want to say the last question? Yes. So the last question was dealing with, um, that asked to select two of the means that you have identified that we, we said, you know, like the, the social media, the speech, the flyers, presentation and stuff, and explain why each of them can be used or how each of them can convey the message effectively.
Okay, sir, thank you. All right. All right, so if anybody has any remaining questions, we have about five minutes left. Um, if anybody was unclear about anything, um, you know, let's just go through. So, um, okay, all right, everybody's saying thanks. You're welcome, everybody. Um, YouTube, New Jamaica Foundation, yeah, this should be on YouTube. This document, like I said, contact the New Jamaica organizers and they will send it to you. Um, it's, not, it's not coming from me directly. As for another session, I don't know how that fits in with New Jamaica's schedule. Um, I don't even know if we have those, those papers, but whether we do or we don't, the questions that will come are very similar to all of these questions. They rarely change. These are what you will get. We will have a session for paper one later on before you guys do the multiple choice, but that's that's further down in, in June, closer to the time. Um, so yeah, I I know it's it's Sunday. Most persons are gonna come up for class on a Sunday, but I just want to thank everybody again and I just want to wish you all the best in your exam when it comes up and stay connected to um, the foundation and what they are saying for any other updates. Right, um, so I can stop sharing my screen. So, like I said, for the document, for all the information, um, for everything, just please contact New Jamaica Foundation. Um, so I'm I'm seeing some requests to run through module two, and first part. I, I guess you mean the first module. Okay, so. Um, it'll be too much to share the screen again, but because we only have like a, a couple of minutes, but let me just go through the whole thing then from top generally about the modules. So module one, right? Module one is dealing with, um, it is dealing with gathering and processing information, right? So module one, uh, you're given a, an extract. Uh, most of the times it's in standard English. It's normally from a, a newspaper, column or an um, article or something. And you're asked basically to decipher the main points, the purpose, um, the organizational strategies, and the language techniques. Those four things. In whatever order, those four things are related to module one. For module two, it is language and the community. So you're given an extract that is either wholly in Creole, all Creole are a mixture of Creole and standard English. And you're asked the, the things in module two related to um, attitudes to language, use of language, contrasting and comparing the Creole and the standard English. And the last question is about showing the, uh, how a visual presentation, whether by television or theater or whatever the case might be, will um, actually aid your displaying the presentation. And then for module three now is speaking and writing. For module three, you are given a very short scenario, very um, like three sentences max about a situation where you need to devise a communication strategy. So for module three, you are only there to um, describe the communication process or you are there to show what you would put in a message to communicate with um, other people, right? So what would you write in this message to the Six Farm Association or to the vendors at the market? Doesn't matter. The point is, it is intended to demonstrate your ability to craft and create a communications message, right? And like I said, you can't make up stuff. They don't care whether it is real or whether it is fake. The point is, they're just testing your ability. So that is a summary of all three modules. Each question is worth 25 marks. They are worth, um, they are worth the same. The first two are essays of 500 words, basically, give or take. And the last one is just a brief, short answer. Um, sometimes it might, I don't think they really ask for 500 words. It's more list than explain. Right? So I hope that is a, a good enough summary of the entire paper. Right, and unless there are any other questions, 
I'm going to turn over to um, New Jamaica Foundation so that they can um, they can wrap up and close. I just want to wish everybody in the best for your exam coming up and stay close to them for anything. Hello everyone, are there any questions for me, for the organization? Well, as it relates to um, extra classes and so forth, of course, it would not be held on NJF's timetable. However, it's feasible. So I will throw the ball back in the court of your tutor. And um, if he's available and can accommodate you guys, then he's free to do so. But yeah, that's about it. The recording, sorry. The recording will be available hopefully tomorrow uh, afternoon. What we usually do is allow the weekend marathons to run off and then we do the uploading throughout the week because these are some long recordings and it takes some time. All right. Um, is there anything else? No. Um, paper one marathon is June 12. Thank you for that. Hello.